Good morning, everyone. I am new to this platform, so I can't tell. I think people are here. I think I see maybe nine people are here. I'm getting a chat from someone I know, Tamata. So thank you for letting me know <laughs> that you're here. So um, good morning, everyone. I'm going to get started. Um, so welcome to Keeping the Fire Alive, uh, Finding Balance and Preventing Burnout. Uh, my name is Paul Johnson. I'm the founder of Proactivism. So Proactivism is a coaching and consulting firm um, where I, you know, my main target audience is um, activists and nonprofit professionals. And um, what I do is help folks uh, work for social change from a place of balance, mindfulness, and resilience. Um, so essentially helping people prevent burnout, manage stress well when they're doing really difficult work to uh, change the world. Um, which is, as we know, not a not a simple task. So, um, and also a disclaimer, normally I like to have this very interactive. I like to have people introduce themselves, um, but we only have an hour and I wanna make sure we get through all the content and you get, uh, you get what you came for, which is um, the information and some takeaways. And I hope we'll have a few exercises um, along the way. So you'll get some time for participation. Um, but uh, normally I like to do some breakout rooms and things of that nature, but uh, we'll make it work. Okay, so um, could I get, let's see, some indication that people can see the PowerPoint? I think I have it sharing. Awesome. Okay, I got a yes. Excellent. All right, so um, we'll start out with uh, just simply what is burnout? Um, what, so right away, I'd love to have some participation. Um, so just shout it out. Anyone can just unmute themselves and, and share what comes to mind when you hear the word burnout. All right. So I'm seeing some. Maybe folks can't um, speak up. I don't know. Again, I'm, I've never used Hopin before, but I'm seeing some great um, comments in the chat. I'm seeing exhausted, over it, freeze in place, stuck, excellent. Um, done, can't keep it carrying the torch. Um, ah, okay, have to be uh, muted, perfect. Um, depleted, fatigue. This is great. Um, so you all kind of have an understanding of it, what it looks like, what it feels like. I think that's one of the most important things. What does it feel like? Um, because at the end of the day, it is it is a feeling. It is an experience of, of stress um, and an overwhelm of stress. So I'll get into um, what that um, what, what that looks like. So let's take a look at just the, the general clinical definition of it. So actually last year, uh, um, if you weren't aware, the World Health Organization actually um, classified burnout as a syndrome for the first time ever. So it kind of gives you indication of how pervasive burnout is. So this is a syndrome that affects people across all industries. Um, it is not uh, discriminatory in its effects because as you can see in the definition, Burnout is essentially um, chronic workplace stress that hasn't been successfully managed. Okay, so it's um, it's stress that is caused by the nature of your work. However, of course, it can be exacerbated by stress from other parts of your life, whether that's personal life with uh, your family, friends, um, or other um, things you're involved in outside of work. But it's, there's three main characteristics um, that the, the World Health Organization um, identified. So the first one is feelings of energy depletion and exhaustion, which I heard from a, a lot of folks, and which is why sort of burnout is an apt term, right? Because all of you and all people go into your job and your career with passion and energy, right? Like this is something that you're excited about. It's what you, you know, maybe went to school for and you're like, oh, I can finally take this degree and put it into action. I'm really excited to get uh, going. And then as you can see in the, um, the 
the uh, photo on the right hand side, it's this slow burnout, right? And burnout isn't something that happens overnight. It's sort of this um, death by a thousand paper cuts. And it happens slowly of energy just sort of depleting over time. Um, another dimension is increased mental distance from one's job. This might look like feelings of negativism or cynicism towards your job. Um, disillusionment is another word that comes to mind. Um, but you just sort of create this, and it's hard to describe, right? It's more about, you know, how you experience it yourself. But it's more this distancing yourself mentally from your job. And all of a sudden, you just aren't as excited or passionate about it. Um, and the cynicism kind of sets in, um, this pessimism towards um, you and whether you can do the job well or the work of the organization you work for or even just the the um, the uh, sort of the efficacy of of your career in general. And then that that's wow I, I forgot about that perfect segue in the last one reduce professional efficacy so that's really just this um, over time you start to lose that confidence lose that um, feeling that you have the ability to do a great job. Um, and it's also this feeling that what you do matters. Um, it's that it, you lose this uh, feeling of that your work is of significance, that it's making an impact on the world. Um, and for all of us at our core, we want to make an impact on the world, right? That is um, sort of this truism for all of us. And our work is one way that we express that. Uh, but if we feel like our work isn't um, contributing to meaning and purpose, um, that can contribute to burnout. All right, I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat. Um, feel free to um, add questions as we go. I'm hoping to get this, um, get through in time to have some questions at the end, but please feel free to um, add in questions as we go. Okay, so we have to talk about stress. We can't talk about burnout without talking about stress and doing a quick biopsychology 101 um, lecture here, if you will. Okay, so another um, in the chat here, uh, before we get into how stress works in the brain, I'd like to get a little bit more specific. So you all shared what burnout feels like for you, but let's get a little bit more specific in the cause of that. So go ahead and write in the chat, what are some um, common sources of stress for you in uh, in your work. So I see you working too many hours, trying to get everything done on time. Yep, too much to do and not enough time. Money, absolutely. Ditto. I think ditto probably refers to everything up there, but probably doing uh, having too much to do. Lots of new things, yeah. Money, absolutely. Roadblocks, stonewalling. Yep. These are really good. I'll wait to see if anyone else wants to add anything. Perfect. Yeah, you hit on deadlines. Yeah, absolutely. These looming looming deadlines. Um, Prioritization, yes. What am I supposed to get? What's the most important thing to get done? And the number of priorities, right? So actually real quick, the word priority, I'm gonna get this wrong, but I remember looking this up. I think actually when I read Essentialism, I found this out. The word priority was meant to be singular. The, the, the original word priority was meant to be singular, as in we're meant to have one priority. Uh, but if, I'm sure for all of you in your, your experience, you have 10. Right, 10 priorities, or like companies and organizations have six strategic priorities, right? And you know, it, it, it looks good, right? It looks good externally, but that creates chaos internally with people trying to get stuff done. And like, what what is the priority of the day, right? And then when that changes all the time, that can really create chaos. So my apologies, I got ahead of myself there, but um, I, I think that's a really good point. Okay, so great, um, great feedback, everyone. So you hit on a lot of them. So here, uh, this this uh, Gallup did a um, did some research on burnout recently, and they uh, identified they surveyed about seventy five hundred employees, and they identified the five main causes of burnout. Um, and actually, let's let's do this. I like doing this. I'd love to in the chat. 
Um, give me your guesses. What do you think? Oh, I just, did I show it? Oh, darn it. I think you can see it now. Okay, well, I gave it away. Sorry, again, my apologies as I'm fumbling through this, this new platform. Anyway, now you see it, but, <laughs> but you hit on a lot of them. Um, the number one cause was lack of control, um, which I saw in, um, I think someone posted something about stonewalling um, and sort of like this lack of autonomy, right? Like you want to push something forward, you have an idea, you want to do something, but then you run oh, roadblocks. That was another thing, right? So that is a big thing, right? Because it's this frustration of, of I don't have control over um, my work. Right, and and we come into a job assuming we'll have that control. Right, it's in the job description. This is what we do. We have control over it. But then when we get into an institution, when there's bureaucracy, when there's politics, when there's lots of people, lots of players in a system, um, we soon lose that lack of control. And and autonomy, autonomy is one of the one of the number one human needs in general. So so it's not a surprise that lack of control is one of the main causes of burnout. Next one is unclear job expectations. So I think that this kind of speaks to priorities a little bit um, or new things. Um, I saw that. So you again, you come into your job with a job description and an expectation of this is my job, but then things change left and right, right? And and out of out of a, all of a sudden, like this is new or this this priority can't, comes through, or this part of your job changed, or this new person started and they're doing this, and am I not doing that anymore? Because that person's doing that. So it's just kind of creates this chaos, right? Um, in our minds of what am I actually supposed to do each day? And that is so fundamental for us to be able to come to work and, and feel centered, right? Um, is is um, being able to know exactly what's expected of us each day. Number three, oh boy, we could do a whole section, a whole workshop on this one dysfunctional workplace dynamics. And again, this goes back to the first two, or it's definitely number one. You don't have control for the most part over this thing, over dysfunctional workplace dynamics. So things like politics, things like toxic workplaces, um, things like um, non-inclusive workplaces, right? People of color, people um, LGBTQIA, you know, if they don't feel accepted, if they don't feel included, if there's um, uh, microaggressions and things going on within the workplace, it makes it very difficult and it's just constant stress, right? Because stress is, is a, a sign that there's a threat in your environment, right? And so a threat could be anything to all of us, right? A threat could be um, that one of your values, your core personal values is not being lived out in the organization um, or a professed value of the organization is not, you're not seeing it within the organization. You don't see it in action. Um, so this is a tough one and really hard to control for. I don't have much adv advice for this other than if it gets really bad, just you have to go. I mean, there's just very little you can do about it. Uh, number four is lack of social support. So we are social beings. There's no doubt about that. So if you feel isolated, um, if you feel um, like you're not supported by your boss or your coworkers, or the opposite, maybe you feel um, completely uh, um, a, a disconnect or misalignment with people, um, or your boss is, is someone who actually is a, um, someone who causes stress, right? Um, that's a big one as well. And then this one I saw a lot of people, workload, right? So I'll say one thing about this. This is very subjective because I think one of the myths about burnout is that burnout is caused by long hours. Yes, that is true, but not all the time. Because if you are, if you love what you do, if you have control, if you have clear expectations, if you have a great workplace, um, if you have a great workplace dynamics, if you have a great boss, and, and you love what you do each day, 60 hours, 80 hours might feel great. You might be energized by that work, right? So it really depends on many other circumstances. Um, but there's a difference between number of hours and workload, right? Workload can actually be something that's more subjective. It could feel like you have a lot on your plate and things keep getting added to your plate. So you have to work long hours. But again, what, what is that workload like? Is it is it a positive workload? Do you like the stuff that you're doing? Are you excited about something ad being added to your plate? Or does it cause you stress and anxiety, right? So it's very subjective. 
Okay, so a little biopsychology 101. The stress response, this is again, very, very high, high overview and I'm assuming you know a lot about this already. But how stress works is very simple. And let me start by saying first that stress is not a bad thing. Let me be clear about that. Stress is, is normal and human, right? And in many cases, we use stress all the time to help us, right? So a couple of examples are, you know, if you're driving down the street in, a, in like a residential neighborhood and a ball, ball goes out in front of you and a child runs to get it, stress kicks in, right? And so you slam on the brakes and you avoid hitting the child. That is stress working for you, right? So we need that stress to respond to situations like that. Um, I'll, you know, also, you know, I, I played baseball through college. I use stress to help me get amped up for a game, right? Like I use that stress to get focused and, and ready and energized to get going. Um, but however, there is a negative side of stress, which is um, essentially chronic stress. But really quickly, the way that stress works is the stress response is essentially a response to a threat. Like I said, something, something is threatening, something is wrong. Um, something is, is bothering you or causing you discomfort. So the, the brain senses that. And then what it does is it then sends a signal to send out stress hormones, cortisol being one of them. You've probably heard that term before. And then it changes everything in your body, right? So you've probably heard this before. Your heart, heart rate speeds up, your muscles tense, um, your, your um, blood vessels actually constrict. This is why chronic stress leads to heart problems because when you're under stress, your muscle, your blood vessels are actually constricting, making it difficult for blood to flow. Um, things like your your um, digestive system shuts down because your brain is essentially telling your body we need to direct all of our resources to responding to this threat in the moment. And the and the way we respond, and I saw this with folks with with a freeze, it's fight or flight or freeze, right? Because a threat. Typically, at least when evolutionarily speaking, was was a predator, right, or an enemy, and so our choices were fight, fight the predator or the enemy, or run away, and so those were basically our two choices. Freeze actually wasn't a choice at that because then you'd be in, you'd you'd be dead. Um, so it's fight or flight, right? So, um, but but the difference is between back then and those cave person days, whatever we call it, is that once you f fought or fleed the threat was over, right? Like you either, you either defeated the predator or you died, unfortunately, hopefully that didn't happen, right? But you defeated the predator or you fl fled to a safe place. And then, then your stress response could shut down. It was done, it was over because the threat's gone. Today, it's so much different because our stress, we don't stress out about predators. We stress out about things at work. And those things are constantly there. They're constantly present, which means the stress response is constantly going. So it's constantly um, creating um, these, these body-wide changes and, and essentially um, putting a load on our mind and our body. And it puts us into fight or flight mode. So I'll talk a little bit about what happens when our brain switches. It's really kind of a, kind of a switch. It's not that simple, but just, just work with me. Um, it switches from um, to a... a, a of self-protective mode, essentially. So when you are stressed, your brain goes into fight or flight mode. So three, three things happen. This isn't comprehensive, but three things that are relevant to what we're talking about, but it makes it difficult for you to be at your best at work. Number one, your cerebral cortex, which is that pasta shaped stuff on the outside of your brain, right? That functioning shuts down because again, it's about energy resources in your brain. Those resources go to the, the, the survival part of your brain, which is your cerebellum, right? The, 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 the core of your brain. So what that means in the workplace is you're less creative, you're less able to focus, you're less able to make decisions, and you're less able to solve complex problems because all of those things are in the front part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex. That is where all of that functioning lives. And that part is shut down when you're stressed. Number two, your brain uses more shortcuts because again, it's about energy conservation, okay? So that means you're more susceptible to acting on stereotypes and implicit bias, okay? Because stereotypes and implicit bias are shortcuts, right? They're ingrained pathways in your brain that have been ingrained over time. And so your brain relies on those 
when you're stressed because it's easy and smooth, right? It takes more resources in your brain to choose a path that you have not chosen before, okay? So this is, you know, this is kind of my spiel, but you can do all the implicit bias training in the world for employees and yourself, but if you're stressed, you're still susceptible to acting upon that. I mean, it's still learn. I'm not saying that they're useless, but there's, there, what's usually not talked about in those trainings is stress management so that you'll be less likely to actually act upon those implicit biases. And number three is you go into self-protective mode. What this means is that you're less empathetic and you're more concerned about your own needs. You're basically selfish, right? For a good reason, right? Because stress is means there's a threat, which means you need to protect yourself. So it's not, it's not a knock on anyone. It's very natural. It's human. But what that means in a, in a work context, in a social context, is you're going to be less empathetic and you're going to be more concerned about your own needs, right? You have this self-focus. And this is what, you know, we, I'm sure we could go through many examples of where we're seeing this in our world today, in your workplace, where people are not, not taking the time to be empathetic, put themselves in the shoes of other people. All right, I need to check on the time, make sure. Okay, I think we're, we're good so far. Um, any questions? Let me just stop real quick. Any, I'm just going to check the chat. Um, Dante, <laughs> good to see you, Dante. Any any questions so far? Um, any any uh, pushback? Any like this 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 guy is talking nonsense? I'll take that too. Cool. Not seeing anything so far. Okay. Thanks, Lynn. <laughs> All right. So let's move on. Um, oh, let me let me talk real quick. I don't have a slide for this, but let me. I think it's important to talk about this. Um, let me talk real quick about um, signs of burnout. Okay. Um, so this is really important because again, burnout is something that happens slowly over time. It is. It is a. Is this like a slow burn? I think even someone said that. Perfectly said. It's not something that all of a sudden you wake up and you're like, oh my God, I am just completely overloaded. I'm, I have no energy left. I'm totally exhausted. It happens over time. So here's some signs to look for um, that will, will give you an indication of, um, of that you're burned out or you're on the, on the verge of burnout. Essentially, and I'm not saying it's the same thing, so, so do not quote me as me saying this, but it's, it's very similar or akin to depression. Okay, and let me again, disclaimer, I'm not a therapist. My work is not therapy. Um, if things move into the therapy realm, I refer people out, okay? Um, but uh, but I, can't, I do do coaching on burnout because there is, there is a distinction um, between those two things. So let me just say it as a disclaimer. But very, very similar to, to depression. So signs are um, loss of motivation, um, uh, a change in appetite, uh, maybe you start eating less or eating more, change in sleep habits, um, social isolation. So you may actually um, distance yourself from people because a lot of times irritability, uh, well, most of the time with burnout, you, you experience irritability. So the smallest things set you off. Um, and, and then you go into like physical signs and symptoms as well. So again, like heart problems. Um, uh, tense muscles, because again, when you're stressed, you're, it tenses your muscles. So, so that um, so you could experience that a lot of tense muscles or, or muscle pain or aches. Um, but just in general, it's, it's this feeling of exhaustion, I want to give up, or learned helplessness, if you're familiar with that term. Um, it's this, you know, no matter what I do, it doesn't matter. Um, so again, it's very similar to depression in a lot of different ways. Um, uh, another thing to be for those of you who work in, if anyone out there is working in like the nonprofit or the helping field, nursing, for example, um, there, uh, compassion fatigue is a thing. Compassion fatigue very simply means you run out of compassion. Um, you don't have any empathy anymore. And that is, again, due to stress. As you can see, you're in a self-protective mode and you just you lose that energy over time to have the capacity, essentially, for other people and their needs. And so there is a limited amount of empathy that we can have in our body, in, in, in our consciousness, or you want to call it, and that can deplete over time. Okay, any questions that popped up? Let me check real quick. Okay, not seeing anything come in. 
All right, so that was really dark. I talked about all the horrible things of burnout, but let's get into um, what we can do and what you can do to prevent burnout. Okay, so here's my thing. I'll give my soapbox for one second, and let me explain myself real quick. I love self-care. I tell people to do self-care all the time. It is, it is fundamental to my coaching and, and the workshops that I do, but it's not enough. It is not the, 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 um, the silver bullet, if you will. And take this, <laughs> take this picture as an example, right? Like it, self-care is this sort of this temporary fix or, or um, uh, an insufficient fix, right? Like, yeah, sure, this person can drive this car just fine, but like at the end of the day, there's not a door, <laughs> right? Like there's more work to be done to really fix the problem. Um, so so kind of keep that in mind as we go, um, because self-care is a way to, to um, relieve stress, but it doesn't get at the cause of stress. And that's what we'll talk about in a little bit. So here's some short-term solutions um, for preventing burnout. And this is where I'd like some participation. Okay, so grab a piece of paper and a pen if you don't have one already. And while you do that, let me just um, talk a little bit about triggers or stressors or whatever you want to call it. So triggers and stressors sort of very simply are um, events or things that happen that cause the stress response, right? Something happens, we witness something, we read something, someone says something to us, whatever it might be, and it sets us off, right? We all know what our, at least, a lot of us know a lot of what our triggers are, and some are unknown, right? Um, but it's really, really important for stress management and preventing burnout to understand what your triggers are. Because, um, and this is something I teach all the time in coaching and in my work, um, using mindfulness as a strategy to, uh, to anticipate and interrupt triggers, okay? So here's, this is very, very simple. This is what I use with people. Um, it's this very simple Mad Lib style, if you're familiar with Mad Libs. They're still out there, by the way, which is cool. Um, this Mad Lib style exercise you can do for anything. When blank happens, instead of blank, I will blank. So essentially how this works is the first blank is what is the trigger? What is the thing that you know will cause stress, okay, when that happens? And then instead of blank, that is your... your, your um, your traditional or your normal response, okay? We all have developed an automatic response to uh, an action that happens, especially an action that happens over time, right? So all of us have developed a habit, it's really a habit of responding to something and we respond to it the same way every time. And again, when you're under stress, your brain relies on those habits more, more often, okay? Um, so, for all of us, we have triggers and stressors, and we norm we have a normal response uh, to that. Okay, that we've developed over time. The last blank is what do you want? What is your desired response? What is your new way of responding to this trigger, in a way that that um, uh, uh, interrupts and prevents the stress response for you, right? For one, and two, um, prevents. Um, an undesired result. So let me give you an example, and then I'll have you all do this yourself. So I'll give you an example to become more clear. So this pro this one's probably, I chose this one because probably everyone can, can um, um, relate to this. So when, when the meeting starts to get off topic, and so that's the trigger, instead of getting frustrated and, and starting to disengage, I will ask an open-ended question to get the meeting back on track. Okay, so the, the trigger, the stressor, the meeting starts to get off topic and that's so annoying, right? And it happens all the time. So the, so my normal response, almost every time when that happens, I get mad, the stress response kicks in, I get frustrated, and then I just like disengage and be like, screw it, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just, I'm out, right? And that clearly is an undesired response because for one, the stress response kicks in and stays kicked in because I carry that throughout my day. And two, it doesn't help the meeting itself. The meeting continues to stay off topic, right? Which then compounds the stress, right? 
So the, the response, the desired response is asking an open-ended question to get the meeting back on track. So it's not a like, come on people, let's get back on track because that's just gonna escalate things, right? It's asking an open-ended question about something on the agenda to get some, back, something on track. So that way things get back, get back on track and everyone's happy, okay? So here's what I'd like you to do. Think of a trigger, a stressor for you and write this down. So when blank happens, that trigger, Instead of blank, write in what is your normal response? What do you what do you typically do? And then write in what is your desired response? What are you going to do when that happens? Because it will happen again. Okay. So take a moment to do that. And then I'd love to have people type in the chat uh, what, what their examples are. And I realized that this whole time I didn't have my headset plugged in, <laughs> but yet you can still hear me. Can you hear me now still? Cause I plugged it back in. Can I get a indication that people can hear me? Okay. Excellent. <laughs> I just looked down at my, my, the end of my microphone was not plugged in my computer. <laughs> Okay, so again, take a couple minutes more to um, write down an example. And like I said, would love to have one or two people type up in the chat what they wrote down. Awesome, so Mark said, when I hit a minor roadblock, instead of putting things away to do later, I will breathe and work through it, love it. I love that. And especially that putting in the, that taking a breath, right? Which is, that's a great stress, uh, stress management strategy. Even like one or two big deep breaths can slow everything down very easily. Great. Okay. Samada said, when a disagreement happens, instead of reacting and getting angry, I will take a pause and some deep breaths to give myself time to respond more calmly. I love it. All the, all these mindfulness folks have showed up. This is great. Yes, this is so good. And taking a pause is so important, right? Because that allows you to first check your implicit bias, anything that you might be acting on, and then and then taking that time to choose your response. And these are great because these will happen, right? Like roadblocks will happen. Disagreements will happen. We can't, we can't control um, everything in our world, but what we can control is how we respond to those things. Okay, I know I said two, but could I get one more? I'm just curious what other people were working on. Awesome, Bailey said, when I get feedback I don't like. Okay, yep, that happens to all of us for sure. Um, instead of getting defensive, I will try to see the other person's point of view and be open to doing things differently. Amazing, awesome. And that, so back to my point about empathy, right? That is, a, that is choosing to be empathetic. And, we, and when we're stressed, it's, it's difficult to be empathetic. But if we're prepared, or when that happens, we're more likely to be able to access that empathy because we prepared ourselves. Great, Lynn said, when I have too much to do, instead of focusing on getting a bunch of little things done, I will step back and figure out what the most important thing to do is. That is such a good one because sometimes when we are overwhelmed, we just keep pushing on without stepping back and looking at the big picture. And we end up just doing a bunch of work that, and I do this all the time, that's why it spoke to me. We end up doing a bunch of stuff that wasn't helpful right? And maybe created more work in the long run. So Lynn, you're kind of going back to that, like the, the idea of priorities too, right? Like what is the main priority? So awesome. Such good examples. Thanks everyone. And you can use this all the time for everything. I use this for when I'm driving, right? Cause I'm like, when someone cuts me off, cause it will happen instead of getting angry and, and giving them a an inappropriate gesture, I will just be like, Hey, it happens. Maybe they're in a rush to get to a job interview or um, something bad happened, no big deal. I'm not going to let it affect my day, right? Okay. The next one is, okay, here's another fun one. Meetings and emails. Without fail, every person I coach on burnout says that meetings and emails are a source of stress for them. So I had to put a slide in on this. It is just, it, 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 they just are a source of stress for people, period. So here are my quick tips on uh, how to deal with meetings and emails. So first of all, the dreaded meetings. Number one tip, if you're able to, 
change the meeting lengths to 45 minutes instead of an hour. The reason, some for some reason, one hour has become the default for, hour, for meetings. They don't have to be that. 45 minutes, what this does is, first of all, it, it challenges you and the group to be more efficient with your time. The other thing it does is it gives you the ability to have space between the next meeting. Because if you do hour long meetings, you can stack them, right? One to two, two to three, three to four, four to five. There is no room or space for you to take a breath, to relax, and then you're frantic running from one meeting to the next. You're usually late to those meetings and you're apologizing and you just kind of go into the next meeting in a, in a frenzy, right? 45 minutes allows you to give some time to stop, breathe, relax, prepare for the next thing. Okay, this is hard for those of you who are, this is Minnesota, so this is gonna sound rude, but I promise you this is gonna be worth it. Uninvite yourself from any reoccurring meetings you don't need to be at. I know that just sounds so rude and mean to do, but in the long run, it's gonna, it's gonna save stress for you and everyone else, right? Because you're just going to these meetings and sitting there and disengaging and feeling resentful and being like, God, I don't need to be here. This is a waste of my time. I could be getting stuff done. So just don't go, right? Just send a polite email and say, hey, you know what? I, I, you know, I trust you all to do this. I don't think I need to be there. Feel free to send me meeting notes, but um, I, you know, I appreciate if you, know, you take me off this, this meeting. It's plain and simple. Um, and then be proactive about it. So if you get a meeting invite and you take a moment, take a pause and be like, do I really need to be at this meeting? Is it essential that I attend these meetings? And if it's a yes, obviously accept it. But if it's a no, decline it. And again, say, you know, I don't think I need to be here. It's nothing personal. I just don't need to be at this meeting. Reduce the number of meetings. Because when I talk to people who are burnt out, they tell me, all I do is be in meetings all day. I never get anything done. So then I'm, I'm stressed about not getting stuff done. And then I got to work at night. I got to go home and work in the evening or stay up late at night or get up early in the morning. Right. And that's when that workload becomes um, negative. All right. Never ending emails. OK. Try to designate two or three times throughout the day to check email because as they're coming in constantly, it's like people, someone poking at you all day long. It's, it's going to affect your concentration. And when you're under stress, you already have a difficulty of focusing. You, you covered that. And this is just another added um, uh, stressor to uh, take your focus away from your work. So just block off a few times throughout the day to check email. And then when you're not checking email, close the tab or shut it down so you're not getting the, the reminders. Here's a, here's a concept, talk in person over the phone. You could save maybe an email chain that goes on for days, right? 20 emails, you could, you could eliminate that with a two minute conversation with someone by talking to them in person. Obviously that's not the case now, but we'll be in a world eventually where we can um, or call them over the phone. Another one, if you're on an email chain, people sometimes just CC you or BCC you and sometimes without your permission, right? And they're trying to be nice. Like, let me be clear, they're trying to be nice. But sometimes you get on email chains and you're like, this does, just like with meetings, this doesn't pertain to me, but it's filling up your inbox. And you're like, ah, oh, here comes another one, here comes another, another one. Just ask to be removed from the email chain. Okay, so there's my quick tips on meetings and emails. Let's talk about long-term solutions. Okay, get clear about your job. This takes some gumption, I'll tell you that right now, because this requires a meeting with your boss. But this is going back to those um, top five causes of burnout, especially number one and two of lack of control and um, unclear job expectations. So set up a time to meet with your boss if you're feeling out of control, unclear job expectations to talk about some key things. Just have a conversation, be very clear. What do I have control over and what, I, what do I not have control over? And give specific examples. I thought I had this project. I thought I was the lead in this project, but so-and-so seemed to be taking over. Now I'm confused. Do I leave this or do I not? Um, or I was supposed to send this proposal and I did, but that got roadblocked. And what happened? You know, like I thought I had control over this, right? So get clear about what you do have control over and what you don't. Um, ask about how your role is distinct from others' roles. So this might not apply to everyone, but some people might have you know, it might feel like you overlap with other people's roles or you might share the same title with someone else. 
Um, so you're kind of unclear of like, okay, that person does that. I thought I did that, but they're doing that. So who's doing that, you know? So just have a, have a moment, even like bring in your job description, print it out and be like, okay, is this still accurate or do we need to update this? And, and if there's managers in the room, do that with your employees, be proactive. Um, like look at the job description almost on a six month basis or one year basis and be like, okay, this isn't accurate anymore. Because again, this is the expectation that employees had coming to their job. So as far as they know, that's still accurate until things change but there's usually never a conversation about what's changing it's usually just like oh this is changing the, the, you know adapt um but what i recommend is is sit down and look at the job description okay ask tell them what you need from them right this is so important and it's really difficult let me let me let me be clear this is difficult because of power dynamics right um and it's difficult to go to your boss and and ask for these things um but most of the time and you know use discernment. Most of the time, bosses would be happy to have this conversation. Um, now, again, ideally, bosses should be the ones um, initiating this conversation, but that's not always the case. So tell them a little, give them some feedback, right? Feedback should be a two-way street, even if there's a power dynamic. Power dynamic does not make managers exempt from getting feedback from their direct reports, right? It makes it easier to avoid getting feedback from their direct reports, but it doesn't make them exempt. So go to your boss and tell them this is what you need in order to feel uh, fulfilled and, and reduce stress in the job. Um, this is really important too. Get clear about what your performance is being measured by. Now, of course, I'm sure you have performance reviews, but a lot of times it's only come once a year. And throughout that time, you're sort of in this like unknown of like, what am I actually being, what are the outcomes I'm being measured on? And maybe that gets fuzzy over time in your job and you're not sure anymore. And that's really important because it helps us stay centered and prioritize, right? And then this is hard too, but but just tell them, and that, you know, I'm I got too much on my plate. You know, like this project is too much. I, I can't do it. I'm not being effective in my job. Like, is there anything you can do to help me lighten my workload? I know that's a hard thing to ask. Um, but if you're in the end, at the end of the day, it's about beating burnout. And, and if your boss is like, not too bad, gotta gotta toughen it up, maybe that's not a great place to work. <laughs> um, so uh, at least you know initiate the conversation for for your own sake. All right, here's my other. Um, let me check the time real quick. All right, we're good. Um, here's my other thing. So finding balance, and this is part of the part of the title, right? Um, for some reason, over time, and well, there is a reason I can't get into it because it would take forever. It's really based in the Industrial Revolution and, and how work looked like you know, hundreds of years ago. Um, but the way that work and rest, the idea of work and rest is structured is now is now compartmentalized, right? So I'm sure for most of you, maybe not all of you, um, you have like a day job, right? Like an eight to eight to five. So the way things work is, and this is the expectation and the norm, it's not written down in rules or policies, but it's, it's the norm. You rest before work, and then when you're at work, during the eight to five, you work in nothing else, right? You just work, that's all. And then when you go home, that's when you rest, okay? The, the problem with this is that working is exhausting, <laughs> right? And, and it's, it's a human, it's a basic human need to rest when we're tired. But the way things work right now in work is that we just push on through the exhaustion. We, it's, it's, some people might be familiar with grind culture. You grind through the exhaustion, the fatigue, the pain. You just push through it to get to the end of the day. Now, the problem with that, because then you're like, okay, but when I get home, that's when I'll do some exercise or that's when I'll take a nap or things like that. The problem with it is that you get so exhausted, especially if you're in the midst of burnout, you get so exhausted that you don't even have the energy to do the things you need to rejuvenate yourself, right? Um, so like, for example, you get home and you're so exhausted, you're like, well, I, I know I should go for a run, but I got to get all my stuff out. It just sounds really, you know, it's, it's cold out. It sounds really you know, like I don't have the energy for it. So I'm just going to sit down and watch Netflix. I'm not knocking that. I do it all the time. I'm not saying that, but but you can see how um, Netflix is not always a reliable way to take care of yourself, to rest, to rejuvenate. Um, but something like exercise, 
meditation, those things will really manage your stress and reduce your stress, right? So again, the problem is by the time we get home, we're too exhausted to do the things that actually will reduce stress. So what I propose when I'm coaching people and, and working with organizations is to look at work in like this. Um, and again, this is, this is not a prescription. This is just an example, but it's really about getting in tune with your body and your, and yourself, but rest should be, uh, incorporated throughout your day. And you, and you should be able to rest when you feel like you need to rest. Um, because at the end, because again, at the end of the day, if you're able to, um, rest to reduce that stress, you'll kick in that creativity side. You'll be better able to focus. You'll be more productive. You'll be able to solve problems better. You will, um, you'll make better decisions, right? But the more you push on throughout the day, all that functioning again will, sh will continue to shut down. So you're just working on autopilot, which maybe you'll get the work done, but you're not going to do your best work. You're not going to be creative. You're not going to make good decisions. You make more mistakes. But if you, you incorporate rest throughout the day when you need it, um, and I, I recommend people build it into your day, right? Like a 10 o'clock walk, um, do meditation at, at 1.30, whatever it might be. It's totally up to you. Um, but incorporate it through your day or be responsive. I mean, that's the best scenario. Be responsive. Be like, you know, I've, I'm feeling really stressed right now. I'm feeling chaotic. I need to step back from my work and go for a walk and meditate or even take a nap. Even take a nap. Naps are very powerful. And, and I'll say, too, if there's one thing you do to beat burnout after all of this is sleep sleep um and and there's actually an article about that that the best way to, to beat burnout is to get enough sleep um so if there's like i said if there's one thing you take away from this is to get that that eight hours of sleep and get a get a um a routine with sleep um, but there's so much more you can do um with with managing your stress right and that's and that's really the big takeaway this is all about managing stress and there's so many ways to do it. Um, and the other thing I'll say too about self-care, because I think this is the last slide, yeah. Um, one thing I'll say about self-care is, um, and again, this is what I do with, with folks, is self-care is so much more than even just the things I listed, right? Like I think most of us think self-care is exercise, yoga, meditation, things like that. And that is definitely self-care. Um, but actually, self-care can be put into six different categories, and I'm going to challenge myself to remember the six categories right now. Social, physical, emotional, spiritual, practical, and mental. I think I got them all. So I love the practical one. So things like cleaning the house it can be self-care. Things like balancing a budget or, or, or keeping a journal can be self-care. Um, things that, that help you, the whole, the whole point about self-care is that you feel better afterwards because, so it could be really anything, you know, if you think about it, it's that after you do it or during it, your, your, the stress response is, is slowing down or shutting down. That's, that's the main takeaway is that you're reducing stress as a result of that activity. So it really could be, it's really about your mindset. So, you know, things, something like doing the dishes, right? If you hate doing the dishes, that's not going to be a self-care activity for you, right? You still have to do it, um, but it's not going to be sort of the self-care thing. But for me, it feels like it. I enjoy doing it because it's relaxing. I like the warm water. I'm getting something done. I'm seeing the results of my work. Um, and I'm able to just like focus on one thing and forget about things for a while. So for me, I feel great doing it. So maybe I, I, I refer to that as a self-care activity, but other people would not. And that's fine. Um, running, for example, that's not a self-care activity for me. I, I can't, I don't run, um, but I do bike, right? So it's really all about what works best for you and you can change it. You can always change your mindset. So if you want cleaning the house to be a self-care activity, you can do it because if you see it that way, it'll become a self-care activity for you. Okay. So, um, we're done early. <laughs> um, here's my information please, please, please reach out. I'd love to chat with you. Um, again, I do coaching um, uh, with, with individuals. I, I do group coaching sessions as well. Um, I do workshops,
trainings around um, just what you saw, as well as getting into more stress management strategies like mindfulness, um, compassion fatigue, um, things of that nature, and, uh, and consulting with organizations, really about developing and helping organizations. Um, because, and this is another article I can, I don't know if I can send it out to folks, but there's a Harvard Business Review article that says burnout, I'm not gonna get it right, but burnout is, is basically the employer's problem, not, not the individual's problem. Because in this individual individualistic society we live in, we tend to blame burnout on us. Right. And we and employers like say, oh, that's just that's an exception. We have one burned out employee. That's just them. They just don't manage their time well. Right. So the blame is individual, but that's that's not true. Burnout is a culture problem within an organization. Um, and and stress, um, stress trickles down, right? So if you have a stressed out leader, that stress trickles down to everyone else in the organization. And the and the systems they put in place about how you get work done. And how you do work, and whether you're, there's room for rest or not, that's created by the leader. Um, so, so that's again. So that's also what I uh, do with organizations: is look from a system standpoint, from a policy, from a culture, from behaviors of what what might be causing burnout from in in the organization itself. Um, so again, feel free to check out my website. Um, that's my direct email. And then uh, feel free to follow me on Instagram. Um, and thank you so much. This was this was fun. Um, but we do have enough time. Um, we have nine minutes. So if you want to jump off, awesome. I saved you nine minutes, and that's always good because you can go on to the next thing with a little bit of space. But um, I'd love to take any questions from people. Um, awesome. We got some questions here. Oh yeah. So first of all. Good, um, really great comments going on here. Walking meetings, so good. Um, how can we help others who we think may be dealing with burnout? Uh, great question. Because um, that's sensitive, right? That's a sense because because people might feel like they're not burnt out. Um, so it depends on the, the relationship, right? Like if this is, um, if this is a, one of your direct reports. You know, it could be a part of a check-in and just ask, always ask open-ended questions. That's probably the best way to take away because you, you obviously never want to get, um, you know, you wouldn't want to come in and say, I feel like you're burnt out, right? Because um, that can put people on the defensive. But just ask questions. How are you feeling lately? Or I've been noticing that, you know, you've been maybe seeing more down lately. Is there something going on? Um, um, uh, you know, just getting a sense on, on, on how they're feeling. Um, but really the way you can help people is is change the culture you know um so, so that way that person just sort of uh, uh deals with burnout by the change of culture right so you you change the culture by maybe for example you um you allow people to i'm just thinking out loud like you allow people to take rest throughout the day or or you know maybe back when uh, we're in in um, companies again, maybe you have a, a meditation room, right? And say, and tell your employees and, and definitely if you're a leader, do it, right? Do it, go to the meditation room and, and meditate or like stretch or relax or whatever. Cause what that's doing is, is giving other people permission to do that. So that person who's burnt out now feels like they have permission, um, cause they're seeing in, in the culture that, that it's okay to, to rest. Um, but again, if they're, if they're burnt out, it's, it's really about what is the cause, right? Ask questions about what might be causing it. Um, but, but it's a sensitive conversation, right? Because they have to be open to talking about it. They might be in denial themselves. Um, but it's just something to monitor over time. Um, great question, Lynn. Anyone else have any questions or comments, suggestions? We have a lot of really good um, mindfulness people in the group. So if you if you have any, please network with folks. Um, I know Mark and Tamata for sure are in that space. Um, empathy and mindfulness and productivity. 
as best. So, so make sure and network with them. Um, but you know, Hey, if we're done, we're done. That's, that's the way it goes sometimes. So, um, thanks again for your time and attention. Like I said, please feel free to reach out and network, find me on LinkedIn. Um, but hope you're all having a great, uh, Twin Cities startup week and, and enjoy the rest of your day.